Good afternoon. Welcome to Poetry Live, our 17th year. This event is sponsored by the Village of Mamaroneck Arts Council. Now our council is composed of volunteers and members and our mission is to highlight the value and importance of art in our lives. Our motto is, art is community. And today, poetry is the voice of that community. I want to share with you a bit of a TED talk I recently heard, and it was called, why People Need Poetry by Stephen Burt. Now in it he said, poetry has made me happier and sadder and more alive. Poetry helps us want to be alive. This made me think of an episode that happened last year when I was at a gathering of family and friends when an aunt who was 99 passed away. And at that gathering, I started talking to a young man I didn't know in his early 20s. And after talking for a while, he told me, poetry saved my life. I said, what? He said, poetry saved my life. He said throughout high school he struggled and was not engaged, lost. And then one day he came upon a poem uh, that he read and this poet spoke to him in such a way that it transformed his life. From then on, he said, he became an avid reader. He, wrote, he read as much as he could and then he started writing poems. He showed me on his phone the poems that he had written and were published in poetry magazines. They were sophisticated, worthy poems, fabulous, wonderful. And so there I said, poetry is powerful. Poetry is powerful. Mary Louise knew that the person who started this 17 years ago, Mary Louise Cox knew that. And she spread the word that poetry is powerful to schools, to communities, and even to prisons. In 2009, she became Mamaroneck's Poet Laureate. She has always been here, right there in one of those seats. But this year, she fell and broke her hip and she's unable to attend today. So, in honor of Mary Louise Cox, I would like to read one of her published poems. It's in this book, it's called Poems Are Where the Heart Is. And she signed this book and gave it to me, and I chose a poem to read, a short poem. And it's called, when there are no words. Listen to that flock of birds singing up the dawn. Watch that spider spinning another web. Sound the singing bowl after it vibrates in silence. Strike it again. Let memories of people and places stream across your mind. Breathe in, breathe out, wait. And so her poems speak to people. Her poems make a difference. And you, all of you young poets, just like she is, you bring words to life. And now, I th would like to introduce our mayor. He's the first person on our program. 
and his name is Tom Murphy. And the one thing about Tom Murphy is that when you see him walking in our village, you know it's him because he's a head taller than anybody else. And so, Tom, would you come up, please? Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep this brief. You know, in, in the village of Mamaroneck, the Arts Council is, is a vital organization. You know, they, they don't take much room in the budget, but they provide what makes life livable. Uh, during World War II, uh, when England was uh, really having a rough time, and uh, it, it wasn't sure that the English were going to survive as a country and as a nation, uh, they were trying to get more money for uh, defense, and uh, they came to Churchill and they said, uh, you know, we need to cut the money for the arts. And Churchill said, if there are no arts, then what are we fighting for? Uh, and, you know, it, and that is basically what it is. The arts are what is the best of us. You know, I didn't understand poetry when I was a kid. I, I remember I went to Catholic schools and I remember being in grammar school and uh, Sister Ann Veronica told us to write up poetry on cards and then to uh, put them in categories. So I had two categories. And she said, what's this? I said, well, they're long ones and they're short ones. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't, that didn't go over too well. But I, I didn't get it. It wasn't until I was in high school. And in high school, I had a, a priest named Father Lux. And he, uh, he punished me for some long forgotten uh, classroom shenanigans. And what he made me do was, he made me write a poem by Robert Frost 10 times. And uh, I wrote the poem 10 times, and maybe he knew that's what I needed to have it sink into my, my thick skull. Because it did. And uh, you know, poetry for me, it's, it's, it's about what we can do with language. You know? Language uh, can inspire us, it can make us feel, it can make us love, it, it, it can make us angry. But the best of language you know, makes us feel, inspires us, and helps us to get in touch with the better angels of our nature. So this is the poem that I had to write 10 times. That I, I, I usually uh, can recite it from my mind, but I don't want to screw it up. So I'm going to read it. Uh, the Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, though having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling you this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And you know, I, I've, you know, that that uh, that poem has resonated in my life because I, I didn't uh, live a, a, a you know a a, a straight uh, you know line life. My life. You know, I don't want to get it. It's my life. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it turned. It turned out all right. I'm up here right now. Uh, but but uh, you know that 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 poem uh, you know gave me solace that you know life is not always a straight line, and that we sometimes get diverted in life, and that's okay as long as we know at the end we we where we're supposed to be. You know, I, I I am so proud that there are children from both of Mamaroneck school districts and children from other uh, communities. Uh, you know, I have a cousin who's a published poet, and who's, his name is Peter Murphy, and you can look him up, and he's the real poet in the family. But I just want to thank all the children for coming here tonight, and the parents for supporting the children, and for the Mamaroneck Arts Council for making this another great day in the village of Mamaroneck. Thank you. Why, thank you, Tom. That was great stories to begin our poetry festival here. Um, well, we are ready to keep on with our program. And I am next going to introduce to you our Master of Ceremonies. Diane Sarna, English, well, you'll, you'll clap for her in a minute. English teacher extraordinaire. 
31 years of teaching, she told me. She looks too young to have taught 31 years, but that's what she said. She not only is an English teacher, she's a creative writing teacher, she does clubs. She is the new, the brand new chair of the Young Authors Conference, which provides a whole day of workshops and speakers for students um, from various high schools and middle schools in uh, Westchester. Diane also every year travels to Nicaragua with her students, with a group of students in a community service project and they build homes while they're there. Her dream is to learn Spanish, which she's doing. She's actually going to get a degree in Spanish. And obviously, she's a lifelong learner and a real poetry friend. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming Diane Sarna. Well, I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I want to thank the Arts Council for asking me back yet again. So kind of you. And uh, no, 31 isn't my age. It's actually the years that I've been teaching. And uh, I am not actually getting a degree in Spanish, but I will uh, hopefully be certified in teaching uh, English as a second language. I am studying Spanish. and. Uh, I'm going to ask a little help later on from my own students, though, with the Spanish in the program. Um, I want to thank the mayor. I had a priest who helped me with poetry, too. In college, Father Bernie leapt up on his desk, crouched and snarled, and started to recite, tiger, tiger, burning bright. Terrified us, especially with the white collar around his neck and then snarling in between. I've never done that for my students. I think that they would never <laughs> get over that. They're all nodding yes. And uh, so, but, but I certainly uh, have a special place in my heart for poetry. You know, it's April, and April is National Poetry Month. So what better place to be on this cold spring-like day? I, I don't know if I should use that term. And I want to thank all the families for being here on a Sunday, especially all the little siblings, grandparents who are here today. So thank you. Um, I'm going to be the one kind of getting everybody up here and lined up. So students, listen up. When you come up with your teacher, you're going to line up. There are two blue X's up here. Line up to the side of the podium so we get to see your beautiful faces. You tend to be way back along the curtain, and we can't see you. I know that's planned, but we're not going to let you do it this year. So please line up between the blue X's a little bit closer to the front of the stage. And you'll go up with your teachers, all right? So we're going to start with Fox Lane High School. Would you please come up? Right over here. They're going to show you how it's done. Right on the blue X's. Good, just make a line. You two should be up here because you're going to be first. Line up, good. Yep, just on a line. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, yes, height order, no, Caroline, you're just not going to make it over there. That's fine, you're fine, you're fine. So just as Jane and the mayor did, I'm going to start with a poem, and this is where I'm going to ask a little help from two of my students. Um, this first poem um, is by a Spanish poet. He's actually from Mexico, Octavio Paz, who won actually the Nobel Prize for Literature in the 90s. And he's one of my current heroes. As I'm becoming more fluent, I'm, I'm finding um, a special place for some of these Spanish language poets. So I'm going to get a little help from two of my friends. So come on over, you two. So Melanie will be on one side, Cecilia on the other. And I'll start in English, and they're going to keep substituting in and doing the Spanish portions. And I'll step back so that you can be in front of the mic. Okay? okay. All right. Between What I See and What I Say by Octavio Paz. Between what I see and what I say, between what I say and what I keep silent, 
Between what I keep silent and what I dream, between what I dream and what I forget, poetry. Entre lo que digo y callo, de Octavio Paz. Entre lo que veo y digo, entre lo que digo y callo, entre lo que callo y sueño, entre lo que sueño y olvido, la poesía. It slips between yes and no, says what I keep silent, keeps silent what I say, dreams what I forget. It is not speech, it is an act. It is an act of speech. Se desliza entre el sí y el no. Dice, lo que callo, calla. Lo que digo, sueña. Lo que olvido no es un decir, es un hacer. No es un hacer, que es un decir. Poetry speaks and listens. It is real. And as soon as I say it is real, it vanishes. Is it then more real? Tangible idea, intangible word. Poetry comes and goes between what is and what is not. It weaves and unweaves reflections. La poesía, se dice y se oye, es real, y apenas digo, es real. Se disciplina, así es más real. Idea palpable, palabra, impalpable la poesía. Va y viene entre lo que es y lo que no es. Teje reflejos y los desteja. Poetry scatters eyes on a page, scatters words on our eyes. Eyes speak, words look, looks think. To hear thoughts, see what we say. Touch the body of an idea. Eyes close, the words open. La poesía. Siembra ojos en la página. Siembra palabras en los ojos. Los ojos hablan, las mira palabras miran. Las pi pala miradas piensan, oír. Los pensamientos, ver, lo que decimos, tocar, el cuerpo de la idea, los ojos se cierran, las palabras se abren. Thank you, girls. Good job. Thank you. Thank goodness I had some help there. So now we're going to start with the Fox Lane crew actually coming up and reading their own poems. I'm going to start with the ninth graders, and um, two of my four ninth graders are here today. One had grandma's birthday party. The other, I think, was too anxious. So I'm so happy that I have my two ninth graders. And um, they're going to be reading poems that were based on celebrating their cultural identities and that it goes deeper than just the food we eat and the holidays we celebrate. And I think you'll know that as soon as you hear from them. So my first student coming up will be Melanie Aguera. She's going to read a, a poem about where she's from. Hello, my name is Melanie Aguirre, and I'll be reading you my poem, Where I'm From. I am from the cherry tree that grows with me. I am from milk and amber honey. I am from the secret lilac garden in my current backyard, with a single table and bench waiting patiently for me, and the roofless room in Antigua, Guatemala. I am from rosy ladybugs and butterflies, the juicy apple trees whose raw red flavor drove even my parents into its temptation. I am from Moyetes and 12 Grapes at Midnight. I am from Ana and Jose. I am from Family Sunday Worship and from loving words of what you do now affects you later. I am from the land of eternal spring and cultural music from the heart that runs in the family thanks to my grandpa. From church nachos and summer watermelon and from my third birthday in Guatemala and from my secret box under my bed. Our next student is Cecilia Reyes. Hello, my name is Cecilia Reyes. The title of my poem is Where I'm From. I am from El Salvador. I am from corn and coffee. I am from a farm. It smells like fresh tree. I am from the apple tree and the orange tree, whose sweet I remember as if have been yesterday. I am from Dia de la Independencia and Navidad from my birth mother Lucy and my grandmother Maria who raised me. 
I am from Dancing Cumbia and Laughing Family, from Vamos a Jugar and Nunca Te Rindas. I am from the Catholic Shore. I am from Santa Rosa and Reyes Branch. From rice and meat, from pupusas and tamales, from my beautiful family and my prima who died. I am fighter and stay positive. I am from a beautiful country like a diamond. Thank you. Very nice. All right, now we get the big kids, the 10th graders. We have uh, a couple of boys who were inspired by family photographs. Um, I sent them out on a tough mission. Talk about how relationships are challenging. Even when we love people, it's hard work. I know that from my two daughters who are now sitting at home. It's hard work relationships. Um, I think that you'll agree um, as you sit there and reflect. So we're gonna have, let's see, how about Ethan Karras will be first. Uh, my name is Ethan Karras. Is we good here? Yeah, we're good. All right. <laughs> uh, my name is Ethan Karras, and the title of my poem is Pictures and Recipes. When I was much younger, my favorite place to go was Ellis Island. There, through the entryway, up the stairs, down the hall, on the right, is a room. And in that room, in a picture on the wall, is my great-great-grandmother, Sadie, clad in all white, her coarse black hair pulled up into a hairnet, standing tall next to a kitchen vat the same size that she is, stirring up a batch of her famous cannonball soup, really just matzo balls, noodles, broth, and a secret ingredient faded from memory. The same soup that, as my grandmother would tell me, caused my great-great-grandfather, who traveled all the way from Poland, to fall in love. I would stay in that museum for hours, staring at her picture on the wall, her strong, firm hands grasping the ladle that is now displayed on the wall in my grandmother's kitchen. My grandmother would regale me with tales of Sadie, how Sadie often brought her to work, waking up at the crack of dawn to take the ferry to Ellis Island, leading the first ever kosher kitchen as they served 12 million Jewish immigrants. I would close my eyes and imagine the wind in my hair and the waves and the ebb and the flow against the ferry and the aromas wafting up from that kitchen out into the crowded dining hall. Years later, over a bowl of cannonball soup, the recipe had been passed down to me, sitting in the kitchen where Sadie's ladle is still proudly displayed, my grandmother showed me the original photo of Sadie. Out of the museum and removed from the glass casing, I saw her closer than ever before, her hands still holding the ladle, gazing defiantly into the bubbling broth. My grandmother doesn't like the way I make cannonball soup. She says that without the secret ingredient, it's only a close imitation. But for me, who only has pictures and recipes, it is enough. Thank you. And next, we have Jack Cadlick. Hi, I'm Jack, and I'm reading a poem called Luke, I Am Your Father. Uh, how can you love someone who only gave you flesh, blood, and skin after they leave you with nothing to remember and ditch you for fame and gin? I hate that picture because people say we look alike. All you do is drink and say, Mom, so uptight. When I see you, sometimes I wish you weren't sober. Life's been hard since 2007 October. Mom had the sense to leave you, took me with her. Regardless of whether you were in the room, you were always bitter. You love me, but it's always the same conversations. It's kind of sad. You don't have any expectations. You cancel visits. I see you only six hours a week. It's like being a dad's an option, so you decide to play hide and seek. How was school? It's a line I've heard countless times. You call every night, but I already know your lines. Taught me to play piano, but not what it meant to be a dad. No catch or fishing. It's made me really sad. Mom and I are scared, wondering if you'll help me pay for college. But you dropped out of school, and I'm barely acknowledged. Keep your money, don't abide by the court case. Spend it on her, just tell it to my face. You're not all bad, sometimes you come to my defense. Unless, of course, it's at your expense. And you only drink half a bottle when I'm around. But when I go to sleep, I don't know what else you drown. 
I know I won't be like you when I'm older. I'll be better, I'll be there, full disclosure. All you do is complain, say the world isn't right. I hate that picture because I see we look alike. So we now have a 10th grade girl who is a former student of mine who was inspired by the news, which is not always good news, and yet it's, a, it's the foundation for a pretty beautiful poem. Here's Caroline Pastilia. Hi, I'm Caroline Pastilia. This is Stamford's Not a Racist Town. It was a cold January morning. Just like any other day of the year, the young Connecticut couple followed their routine. Get up, make coffee, go outside into the chilling wind and frost-covered ground. He waits on their porch while she checks the mailbox for the daily news. As his wife walks back across the eroded driveway, gravel crunching beneath her feet, the breeze grows stronger as if to say, don't turn around. But she did. The newspaper fluttered aimlessly to the ground, mimicking the surprise etched into the woman's features. There it was, haunting black, bold letters glistened with residue, like they were dripping with sweat after running a marathon, only to splash themselves across the previously white paneled garage door. One word, a slur, a hateful response from bigot to black. Why was this acceptable? That word should have been a thing of the past. This was 2017. Didn't we live in a country that prides itself on freedom and acceptance? They had thought they were safe from ignorance. Such a malicious message was unfathomable in this town. Instead, they are forced to grab a sponge, scrub until knuckles turn white, and pretend it didn't happen. Thank you. And the last student reader today also was inspired by a photograph um, of a sibling who actually I, I taught as well. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sasha Bogorayev. Hi, I'm Sasha Bogorayev, and I'll be reading Change or the Lack Thereof. Ten years after it's taken, two years after she left, the photo lays in front of me. When I gaze at it, two people stare back from the bench where they are seated on a frigid winter day, me and my sister. I am looking upon her with an unwavering gaze while she stares at the camera in disdain. Uh, the red and blue jackets we wear should protect us from the elements, but all they do is distance us further. All my childhood, I want to be noticed, appreciated by her. Yet she would turn me down, slowly wearing me down, like enamel on a tooth. And all I could do in return was fight. In my mind, another snapshot appears. Across the room from me, she lounges on a couch with a computer. At the time, I did not have one. She is snickering at whatever she is reading. Inquisitively, I ask, what are you laughing at? Her response comes not in words, but in the shape of a sharp, shooting stare. Another image in my head of me at age seven, outside of the ski cabin. I stare at my sister as she goes off with her friends, leaving me all prepared and ready to go by the door. Why is it nowadays, even when she is no longer around, I can constantly feel the weight of expectations she has left upon me? In the photo in front of me, I'm half on, half on top of her in an effort to be noticed. Why is it that all these year la years later, I feel as if I'm the one under her, feeling her pressure on me? Have I not learned from the past? Thank you, Fox Lane. You get to sit while everybody else is anxious now. Go ahead and sit. Thank you. So that's how it's going to happen today. We're going to call Rhineck teachers up for Rhineck Middle School and their teacher. Come on up.
they've asked me to read um, Heart to Heart by Rita Dove. It's neither red nor sweet. It doesn't melt or turn over, break or harden, so it can't feel pain, yearning, regret. It doesn't have a tip to spin on. It isn't even shapely. Just a thick clutch of muscle, lopsided, mute. Still, I can feel it inside its cage, sounding a dull tattoo. I want, I want, but I can't open it. There's no key. I can't wear it on my sleeve or tell you from the bottom of it how I feel. Here, it's all yours now, but you'll have to take me too. So, I'll be calling up our first poet for tonight is David McGill. My name is David McGill, and I'll be reading Bat. The mammal escapes day into the night, looking for a lucky prey. Like a plane about to crash, it attacks two little bugs. To the bat, it's Thanksgiving. To some, it's a winged nightmare. U using a nearby cave as a laboratory, its clones sleep on the ceiling. When a nearby traveler passes, a storm of wings start to screech. As light colors the sky, the bat eludes each ray into the next, next paint of dark. <laughs> Our next poet tonight is Alexis Friedman. Come on up, make sure your mouth is right in it and you're right here on the left. My name is Alexis Friedman and I'll be reading my poem, Winter's Toll. So quiet you could hear a pin drop, all animals escaping winter's whisper. Deserted fields give off a cold hard stare, the sky is as dark as a fire's burning ember. On and on it seems to go. Nights and days pass, a graceless drag, until a brave stem breaks between the war between dirt and ice, signaling an end to Jack Frost's wrath. Uh, next is Kay Obata. Hi, my name is Kay. I'm going to read Pride and Pinstripes. I was there when he hit a moonshot as I wrote this very poem. This is the day that I found out balls can glide like your destiny, like dreams. Inside the ballpark, there was a heat of passion, pride, and pinstripes, the gaping crowds, and the smoking hot fries. The moment the ball skimmed the bat, the crowd froze like an ice cube. Time slowed like a captured photo. No one dared take a step, the crowd's expression turned bright as if a singer had finished our anthem. There was hope and optimism. On a tranquil afternoon with a slight breeze, there was a humongous cheer. A ball soared through the sky. The batter had just hit a grand slam, a moonshot. Thank you. Isabella Fasolino. Just make sure your mouth is right in it. That's right there. Okay. The sound of the sea. The smell of salt wavers in the air as her footprints deepen in the cold, wet sand, leave a trail of where she's been and a path for those to follow. The rising tide, ever so slowly, creeps up like the sun in the east. Then a wave washes by, covering the sand in a cool blue blanket. Her passage has been sealed as swiftly as the sea. Thank you. Matthew Lord. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Lord, and my poem doesn't uh, have a title. The wind rustles through the trees, sending snow tumbling to the ground. Like a white blanket, it covers everything. Animals and people sleep. There is a stillness in the air, dark, quiet, calm, like a quilt over the world, hiding terror and strife. But like vitriol burning at flesh, as the sun rises, it all melts away. Jacob Anderson. Hello, my name is Jacob Anderson, and my poem is titled The Mind, and it was inspired by Rita Dove's Heart to Heart. It's not a strand of sausage, or hard, like a rock. It isn't jello, all jiggly and squishy. 
It's perplexing and outstanding, small yet strong, works around the clock and isn't shapely. It acts as the Houston Control Center, making decisions. The mind tells the body what to do. No one has its key, but they keep searching, save for its thoughts, like a bird in a sanctuary, running, jumping, and dancing it does while you are asleep in bed. I know where its key is, and I will show you, but I want yours too. And last but not least, Jacob Wiesman. My name is Jacob Wiesman, and my poem is called Rock. Why would somebody be a rock, an immobile gray piece of hardened earth, a waste of space? It's only hope to move, to be thrown into a lake by a kid. It exists without a purpose, only hoping that it will grow legs. The rock sits for 10,000 years, cold for 10,000 winters, covered in leaves for 10,000 falls. At last thing ever person to have ever lived, never thrown into the lake. Thank you. Okay, and next up will be Mamaroneck High School. Come on up. Uh, Jenny Thiel did not give herself credit, so I'm giving her credit. She's been going to this I, I, for many years, I, I, almost, I think, as long as I have been going here. How many years, Jenny? You've been coming here a long time, I, I, yes. So um, congratulations to Jenny. Those were middle schoolers that I, I've never thought of a brain being like a bird. And it's not like Jello. I agree. I'm glad of that. And uh, so I'm going to let my, the next teacher come up and make sure you give yourselves credit. Uh, I'm going to introduce Alan Mitra, who's going to read his poem, Life and Now, inspired by Walt Whitman. He's a returning poet to Poetry Live. Um, and his teacher, Elaine Almos, you know, sorry she had to miss this, but Alan Mitra's Life and Now. Part one, when a fishbowl is tapped, the fish is only startled before it sees that the bowl is impenetrable to the dainty finger. The evils beyond the bowl make no difference to the fish. With my rounded head, my skull is the bowl and the fish is my conscience. Fish of the ocean hunt and worry for their daily food. I and my bowl need not worry. For regardless of their struggle, my feed comes from the heavens. O ye ocean creatures, worry not where your food will come from, so that it may fall from the heavens for you too. Part two, the birds are singing in the afternoon air. I do not listen to what they say. The trees color the landscape. I do not dwell on how they got there. I do not search to understand God's gifts but to reap joy from them. The sky is blue today, a wonderful blue. That is all I need. The snow embellishes the earth. That is all I need. The sun warms my soul. That is all I need. The rain washes my face. That is all I need. Why search for a meaning when there's more joy in the existence? Our being is beautiful without meaning. And now uh, Ruby Odierna is going to share her poem, which is untitled. The body you were born in receives you, finds you in the discomfort of short days and shorter breath, leaves you in empty air and lacking, balances thought upon feeling upon thought before you. What you know of yourself, that is in the physical as much as the imaginary. What you know of others, that is in the constant as much as the temporary. I think some people are born with a sickness, born moved by eternity, 
born with the belief that to stop time is really just to die slowly. I will find any doubt in the pause of your breath, in the flicker of your eye, in the twitch of your mouth. I will catch you here, lay your lies to rest under my tongue, and melt them with yours. Hi, I'm Juliana Zalon. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Amelia Pantagozo, reading her poem, More Than Just an Immigrant. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia. I know you still hear the clanging of train tracks at night, your knuckles scarred with bruises of holding on to tops of train cars too tight, waiting to be caught with no excuses, no matter what they are indifferent, but I know you. You're more than just an immigrant. I know your eyes, once filled with unforgiving sands and highway dust. They've become wise, heavy with the knowledge of things you never discuss. Death, disease, deprivation, common ailments of immigration. I know your heart. I know how broken it still feels, leaving love behind to restart away from no opportunities, no safety, no meals, to work for less than you deserve every day while remembering it can all be taken away. I know your label, a burning brand you cannot disembody, read and tossed around like a playbill, a disease infecting every ignorant nobody, discriminated against for wanting something more, more than gangs, more than fear, more than war. I have no right to whine and moan over tired eyes and aching bones when I know what you've been through, just to break through an undeserving reality where thousands of others are waiting to be set free. Everyone knows the first man on the moon. Everyone knows the woman who refused to get off the bus. But let me tell your untold story, because the rest of the world deserves to know too of a heroic person like you. You're more than just an immigrant. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Darren Bosch couldn't be here, so I'm gonna introduce his stu student, Lauren Kroll, uh, who's reading her poem, Perceptions, inspired by Wallace Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, and Kiki Smith's uh, untitled picture from 1993, which is really worth looking up after you hear the poem. It adds more meaning, too. Uh, hi, my name is Lauren Kroll, and my poem is entitled Perceptions. One, we are muddled, dazed, and confused. We've taken every which way, but somehow always followed that same winding path that comes to a sudden and unanimous conclusion. Two, her mind is set astray, left to run wild and jump to conclusions and ends up in a tangled, destructive mess. Three, the painter's mind is blank. He cannot decide what to create next, and as a result, he is frustrated and angry. He slashes black paint across an empty canvas as a reaction to his inability to think creatively. Four, in opaque, misty nights, the only light that reflects is on the completely black river, shimmering in bare moonlight as it curves through looming oak trees. Five, the base behind it holds its own torturous madness. Jagged lines run up and down, barely visible in gray splotches as though they were motions running wild in the mind of a crazed individual. Six, spilled ink leaves much to be spoken. So many words could have been written, so many ideas could have been born as the ink trails down parchment paper. Seven, I invite those around me on a tour of my now open mind and body. They recoil repulsed by the view of blackened intestines that seem to have been poisoned and destroyed. Eight, a child cannot learn how to tie his shoes. He's pulled the shoelace completely out of its lacing and folds each end over one another again and again until it is formed into a perfect bow. Nine, as he walks down the sidewalk after a long day of work, a man looks in a bakery shop window. He sees an appetizing pastry with an elegant swirl as a signature on top and goes in to purchase one himself. It's a nice reward after an excruciating work day. 10, running cables spin endlessly. 
When touched, energy bursts through and sparks that jolt and flash golden electricity that stuns the mind with amazement and the body with pain. 11. A man leaves a trail of gasoline with a match in hand ready to strike a blaze. But despite the temptation, he has chosen not to. Why? 12. She holds a telephone to her ear. On the other end, there are countless messages that travel through waves into the receiver. The words spiral around in her head, encircling as she processes them and takes in their meaning. 13. In the distance of approaching nightfall, a man can see rounded buildings across a city nightscape. He wishes to visit one day. Thank you. I'm Maria Fairbairn, and I'm introducing Sam Lodge, who will be reading his kaleidoscope inspired by Whitman as well. Sorry. A child stands, watching, wondering, dreaming, asking, what is a kaleidoscope? Where numbers turn to thoughts, turn to dreams, turn to nothing. A man sits, waiting, waiting, waiting. When young turns to old, turns to new, the kaleidoscope reaches. A family runs, breathing, greeting, meeting. Time goes, running into the silence. We have to go. You have to go. He has to go. The trees gather with stories to whisper, painting the words, listening. The leaves fall one by one. Running through the forest goes the kid, hoping to hear more. Tree to tree to tree, remembering the last, building the present, propelling forwards past the silence. Thank you, Mamaroneck High School. And now I think we have some music as Hummocks Middle School comes on up with their teacher. Curdy Little, and it's great to be here today. I, I have been coming to this for many years, and I don't remember hearing such great poems before. These are really phenomenal. I'm impressed, and, and really, really great. Um, we have a, a kind of fantastic group here today. Um, we have a, a sailor, a world traveler, um, a ballet dancer, um, someone who's from almost 4,000 miles away, you can guess which is which, and then someone who played Katerina in The Taming of the Shrew, um, and many others even. So it's such a great group. I hope you'll listen to them and welcome them. And I wanted to start out with a poem called Spring and Fall to a Young Child by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I was struck by what some of the other people have said about how um, in difficult times poetry speaks to us. Uh, my brother died in January and I had known this poem a long time. It talks about how when you grieve, you grieve also for yourself not just for the person, and I never really understood, I don't think, what that meant until um, my brother died, so I wanted to read this one today. Spring and fall to a young child. Margaret, are you grieving over golden grove unleaving? Leaves like the things of man you, with your fresh thoughts, care for, can you? Ah, uh, as the heart grows older, it will come to such things colder. By and by, nor spare a sigh, the worlds of wanward leaf meal lie, and yet you will weep and know why. Now, no matter, child, the name, sorrow's springs are the same, nor mouth had, no, nor mind expressed, what heart heard of, ghost guessed. 
It is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret that you mourn for. So I will introduce our writers today. And I wanted to tell you that some of them are published in the Homics Writer. This is our literary magazine. I left some out on the table. Feel free to take one if you wish. And our first poet is Anna Drutel reading Jealousy. It twists your soul and cuts like a knife. <coughs> it hurts other people and hurts you. And it haunts you and worsens your life. Where there is this feeling, there is strife. Now it's too late, your life is askew. You have wrecked your reputation. Now there is nothing that can explain. The fact that you now have a dictation over your soul, your own nation. The good left in you shall not remain. What you did cannot be undone. Did you think before you acted? What you are doing is not at all fun. Nobody, not even you, has won. Your careless actions make you distracted. Now, after a while, time stands still. No one will forget what you did. It twists your soul and cuts like a knife, and still, what this is, it does more than kill. Your heartless ways, good shall forbid. Thank you. Anna is Bob Morrissey's uh, student who is retiring this year after 31 years teaching at Homics. Uh, he's been working six days a week as also a track coach uh, from Amerinek. Uh, Award winning, I will say, that's where he is today. Um, our uh, next poet is uh, reading a poem um, that is inspired by Louise Gluck, and it's called The Little Dark Stopping Hood by Enora Gornison. Hi, my name is Enora, and I'm going to use an unusual word, nyctophilia. It means a preference for the night or the darkness. The old dark stopping hood. This is a visit I wanted. All the good we have done is now hunted. I overhear wolf howling for his desperate soul, a spirit that's filling his hole. Now, far from mother's cuddle and mom's voice in the wolf's bowel, we wither in a bitter lemon place. Why do we still feel his mouthpiece? The wolf digesting grandma, digesting life. It's been years, though there's no piercing knife. No one reacted, not even you, grandmother. I looked after you, though my death was not my brother. Your rotten decision had made us perished, as the darkness surrounded, as light was cherished. But I sacrificed for you. I saw delicate dove diving from the sky, suffocating and turning the land into a battle cry. My nyctophilia doesn't mean that I don't need someone to be here at, for me at night when ticklish grass isn't light anymore. Is dying the one, the one that would make me get out by the door? Breathe deeply, grandmother. We'll find a way to get down from the gluey space by the end of the day. Our next two poems were inspired by things that are going on in the news. I think you'll recognize that. The first is Fear in Florida by Will Knowles. Hi, I'm Will Knowles and I'll be reading uh, Fear in Florida. Today I heard some frightening news. The sights and sounds really gave me the blues. With their hands in the air as helicopters whizzed by, kids ran from their school with tears in their eyes. Coaches, teachers, and students lost their lives on this day. The sorrow and grief, there are no words to say. It made me stop and wonder, how could this world be so cruel? The very place we should feel safe is our home and our school. But the world as we know it is not a safe place. Too many guns and violence is the reality we face. We must stop ignoring, sorry, we must stop ignoring the world as it is and make laws to keep it safe for to make to keep it a safe place for our kids. If we choose to ignore the way that things are, the scars will go the, the scars will grow deeper both near and far. Thank you. 
Thank you. And our next reader, also inspired by the news, is Lungezzo Sandrum reading an untitled poem. Um, hello, my name is Lungezzo Sandrum. Um, I, um, I, I wrote my poem, um, I, was in, I was not inspired by Harriet um, Staff. I was confused by my teacher explaining the rules of um, writing it. So uh, I just wrote Harriet Staff. But my poem is untitled. He was shot with his hand his po hands in his pockets, wearing a hoodie. Don't assume it's a black guy with, with a hoodie, with a bag, hands in his pockets, that he has a gun, he has a weapon. Don't just pull. Look, talk, ask, wait. If we pull, we lose. If we pull, he loses. If we pull, he, he, doesn't, go, he doesn't go home. He's missing a family. He never comes home that day. Black Lives Matter, Ch change. They say, they say it's a free country. They say, they, say, they say all lives matter, but, but you're wrong. Black lives don't, they lie. They, they accused, and in 1619, they hated blacks. Years past, black lives don't matter. And now it's 2018. We're back to where we started. It's always, it's always he sh he's, he's shot. He stole something. He, sh he shot him. He's in a gang. Like, damn, black lives matter. Black lives do, don't matter. Change. We need to change. Thank you. Our next poem is inspired by Mark Strand, uh, and it's going to be read by Arturo Paras, and it's called Cooking Code. Hi, I'm Arturo. Uh, my poem is Cooking Code. Programs run from the tips of my fingers. There is no happiness like mine. I have been cooking code. The code instructor does not believe what she sees. Her eyes are stunned, and she walks with her laptop in her hand. The code is gone, the screen is bright, the cat is on the grassy plain going right. Its voice box purrs, its, pist its orange legs move like pistons. The startled code instructor begins to breathe in deep and leap. She now does understand when I get on my feet and start to dance, she applauds. I'm a new boy, I smile at her and bow, I prance around in the classroom's light. Our next poet is Anne Robarts, reading Stepping on Satin. Hi, my name is Anna Robarts. My poem is inspired by Mark Strand called Stepping on Satin. Sweat drips from my fingers, my toes crammed from floating. My arms become wings, my nose smells hairspray. My pancake leaves tracks, my tutu flops up and down. The crystals sparkle from the bright light overhead. Stepping on satin, drowning in air, flying in water. Soon things stop, and there's no more show. Thank you. Our next poem is called Little Angels, and it's being read, uh, it was written by Victoria Verdiguer. Hi, my name is Victoria Verdiguer. I wouldn't really recommend trying to say my last name. Um, my poem is called Little Angels, and it's a poem I wrote about feminism. They batter little angels, red tears fall to the floor. Their fists and words and ethics break the halo of their souls. Dry up your tears, sew on your wings, stand up right before them, that's how you'll be free. Vulnerable little angels, the devil will try to manipulate you, to use you, to make you cry. Little angels, don't give up. Little angels, you'll be fine. Fight the battle, win and thrive. Don't worry, little angels, you will be all right. Like gasoline to fire, your fear will defeat, making you smaller and smaller and trample you under their feet. But you're stronger than fear, more powerful than you seem. And like pondering water, turn the blazing fire into Placid's team. You are not little angels. You are not little dreams. You are warriors of justice. You are women. You are free. Thank you.
I tried to get her to read slow, and that actually, that was good for, okay. Uh, this next uh, poet I wanted to mention, I, I noticed when uh, when I was watching the kids here that uh, he was reading, and he's always reading, he's reading in my class, he's reading in math class, he's reading it all the time, which is good. But I thought, today, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he's reading. And then I saw he was studying science. Uh, they, they have this huge science test coming up, and I thought, oh gosh. So I, I am very grateful that Alexis von Albertini Mason came today, and today he'll be reading lines for spring. Uh, I'm Alexis von Albertini Mason. I'll be reading Lines for Spring, an imitation of Lines for Winter by Mark Strand. Tell yourself as cold melts into warm and the light bends and crawls al along the floor that you will go on, running, contemplating, the same thoughts no matter how far you go. Even if you find yourself surrounded by burning pink or with the wind rustling through gentle green or by the roaring flow of crystal clear blue, today as the sun rises anew, think to yourself what you hear is nothing but the thoughts you carry as your stride quickens. And you will never be able to slow down again and listen to the hollow sound of an empty wind rustling through endless fields of brown and gray. And if it happens that you fall or trip or fall, or if you find yourself tumbling downwards or falling silently, tell yourself in the final rush of warmth leaving your stone cold lungs that there was truly an end to the race you ran. Hello, my name is Laura Mercogliano, and I'm happy to introduce our first seventh grade poet from the Homics Middle School. Uh, his name is Ronnie Aversa, and he'll be reading a poem inspired by Billy Collins. I ask myself, what is a poem? A poem is a poem that shines in the light and shimmers in the water. A poem is a room filled with ideas and many more to come. But then I wonder, do other people think the same thing? Poems can bring ideas to people and have people make more poems. I like poems because they inspire people. Our next poet is Hannah Clark, who will be reading a poem inspired by Gwendolyn Brooks. It all just happened, no hesitation. It was a storm, a huge, terrible sensation. Live not for the battles won, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. A wave covered my sight, I wanted to just grow wings and take flight. I felt my heart drop along with the wave, the water filled my boat and I couldn't be brave. I held my breath, hoped for the best, I closed my eyes and wanted to curl up inside. But when I opened them, it was over, just like that. I lay flat in my bed, I fe it felt like I was just hit with a bat. But it was all just a dream, it would only be a memory. It was all just a dream, thank you. Our final poet is Ariana Sparati. Inner voice. On the outside, I am weak. I crumble from others' words. On the inside, I am strong. I imagine my own worlds. My face is a mask, and it's all one big lie. My brain is a task, and it's all stuck inside. My eyes tell the truth, innocent and fine. My heart is me, on the inside. How you see me is your choice. How I see me is my inner voice. Thank you. Good job, folks. You can have a seat. Thank you so much. Next time you wonder if students have voices, think about today. What strong voices you've heard from these middle schoolers. So now, our last school, West Lake High School. Come on up. Thank you. 
We have um, quite a mix of, of students here, um, several of which are from my creative writing class, which is thankfully very small, so I get to work with them very closely. And then I also have some of my, my former English students who have taught in ninth grade and also some of them in eighth grade. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Chris DiPolito, by the way, and we are uh, Westlake High School. The first poet is Ava Zadrima. We'll be reading Secrets. Uh, hi, I'm Ava Zadrima, and I'll be reading Secrets. I belong to the silent, the trusted, the close-lipped, the quiet. I belong to nature, the wind, the stars, the body. I belong to the darkness and all that hide, run, steal. I am lies, and I am loyalty. I am silence. Our next poet is Colleen Bradley. A reading winter. As certain as it seems, winter can be a fickle season. One day you are in the ski mountain, rushing through slush and ice and water. The next, you are freezing in a lift, snow flurrying down with wind, blowing away the warmth of the previous day and clouds into the clear sky. I never cared for the cold. I always preferred the warmth and sunshine of other seasons. But there's a tranquility, a peacefulness in the winter months that allows for speedy skiing and glowy fi glowing fireplaces, cozy socks and hot cups of tea, icy roads and refuge at home. While you can depend on summer for endless heat, spring for blooming flowers, autumn for changing leaves, you can always depend on the dynamics of winter. Michelle Flynn will be reading Five, um, five Roses. Hi, I'm Michelle Flynn, and I'll be reading Five Roses. I remember the snow, the cold. I remember the sky, a stunning gold. I remember the charcoal-covered shoes my father wore. I remember the yellow flowers my aunt carried. I remember the smell of fresh soil. I remember the sound of bagpipes. I remember the prayers and the blessings. And I remember the only thing I found comfort in that day were those five roses. And even though I might forget the color of the sky, my dad's shoes, and the smell of soil, I will always remember you. Thank you. Next is Michaela Birch. Hi, I'm Michaela Birch, and I'm going to be reciting Chains. The rusty chains drag me down. Will I ever be free again? One problem turns to two, two turns to three. It's a never-ending nightmare, and I'm the star. My life is slowly wasting away, and it's all my fault. But then I remember they were not the f first chains to bind me. So I pick myself up and breathe in deeply. Soon enough, I am finally free. My scars are a token of my struggle and a reason to thrive. Next is Rebecca Cross. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and I'll be reading Forceful Reality. For the evil that feeds them, they ignite their passion. For the darkness that engulfs them, they cast their energy. For those who blindly lead them, they run their eagerness over. For the forces against them, they bellow their souls. For the power, the dominating power, for what? They later cry out in infamy. For the evil that feeds them, for the chains that incite them, for the pit that enlightens them, is their creed. For what? Next is Samantha Karlowski. Hello, I'm Samantha Karlowski, and I will be reading Fairy Tale Illusions. The stories have it wrong. There are no glass slippers, no bell towers, no fairy godmothers. And you cannot fall in love in a dance. Love is a waltz that takes a lifetime, not a song. The stories have it wrong. There are no curses, no magical roses, no beast-like princes. And you won't find talking teapots here. You cannot force someone to change. They change themselves. The stories have it wrong. There are no evil queens, 
no poisonous apples, no seven dwarves to be seen. And you cannot walk into a stranger's house. Trust is something earned over time and lost so easily. The stories have it wrong. Seeing is believing and dreaming is deceiving. Happily ever after afters don't come around so often, but that's what makes them all the better. Thank you. Next is Amanda Bradley. Um, I'm Amanda Bradley and I'll be reading Metamorphosis. The mountain seems too high to climb. We will climb nonetheless. Our power comes from their doubt, their fear of what we may do with our voices. And when we do rise, they will have no choice but to listen. Next is Gabby Morituri. A hundred letters written back and forth, two years till love's reunion. It's winter time. The war may be bitter, but the feel of love blooms. Worlds apart, yet hearts so close. The tattered scribbles as an emblem of love. The heartfelt writings are blown away to her loved ones miles away. Isolation in the face of war cannot divide their love. He looks up at the star, she looks up at the sky. The same star above, yet miles apart. Nothing can divide them but the letters they write that come from their heart. For two years will pass before the time comes to reunite under the stars where their hearts fell in love. Thank you. And finally, Cassandra Green. Hi, I'm Cassandra Green, and I'll be re reading my poem, A Poet's Attempts. All day, I attempt to write a poem. All day, it doesn't sound right. I try to use a rhyme scheme. I try to get inspired by my music. I tried, I failed to come up with something. I failed nearly every time I tried. But despite this, I'm here, trying again, right now. I'm here. How did I do? <laughs> Good job, Westlake. You, you all did very well. Okay, have a seat. You guys can have a seat. Good job. Nice job. What a good way to end. Now, we're not done because we, we have audience participation. You know, it was hard to top last year because last year it was William Shakespeare's birthday. My students are laughing because I have a shrine in my room to William Shakespeare and I fondly refer to him as my second husband. And then I reassure them that my husband knows all about it and since he's been deceased for quite some time, my husband is fine with that. But this year, we're still a week before William Shakespeare's birthday and we had to come up with something new. Singing happy birthday a week early just didn't feel the same. So instead, as you came in, each of you received a colorful flower, and in the middle of that flower is a line or a few lines of poetry. So this is the audience participation. Yes, you may trade if you like someone else's better, but I'd like you to have an elbow partner right now. Turn to your left or your right. Maybe the person in front of you or behind you. Take a moment to read to each other. Go ahead. Feel what it's like to be up here. Do that first. Go ahead. There's more to this, but do that. <laughs> Who's happy with their line of poetry? Who likes their line of poetry? Yeah? Maybe you'll actually look up that poet. So, yeah, we're going to have even more participation. We'll ask a few of you to stand up. Um, I'll start. By the way, I want to give a, a big thank you to the Creative Writing Club at Fox Lane High School, who last Monday sat down and typed all of these up. And another thank you to my daughter and her boyfriend, who sat and cut all these out last night. 
so mine is by Mary Oliver, who um, some people call her the female Robert Frost, but I just like to think of her as a very good poet. She does a lot of nature poetry. And this is from um, a poem called Every Morning. How the morning itself appears like a slow white rose. Who else would like to read their line or lines out loud? Go on, be brave, who wants to start? Caroline, go for it, stand up. Maybe face, oh, look, you've got a microphone. I just looked up what one of these words meant because I didn't know what it meant, so I just looked it up. Good girl. Okay. <laughs> the cattle egret moved out of the sunlight like so many pieces of white ribbon. Who wrote that, does it say? It's, yeah, it's the same uh, poet oh, as the one Oliver. you just read, Mary Oliver, yeah. Now that you know there's a microphone, I know you all want to put your hand up. Who else? Oh, right there in the back. Yep. Do you want me to stand up? That would be great. Oh, OK. Hi. All right. So there's a kind of white moth, I don't know what kind, that glimmers by mid-May in the forest just as the pink moccasin flowers are rising by Mary Oliver. Go, Mary. Right, who else? Who else would like to? We have a lot of other poets out there. Oh, we have some over here on the other side, far other side. Oh, right there. Go for it. As dew drips gently, gently, the doves murmur their chant. Nice job. We have a few over here. Yes, we'll walk with a, with a walk that is measured and slow, and we'll go where the chalk white arrows go. For the children they mark and the children they know, the place where the sidewalk ends. An old favorite for many of you, I bet. Who else? Who else? We have time for a couple more. Oh, there's one way over on this side. They're trying to make you exercise. We tried to walk it softly to miss the early flowers with our feet, but stooping now and then to break one from the ground, crumble it and sniff. From Day of Gold by Geoff Hewitt. Geoff Hewitt, very good. I will be the gladdest thing under the sun. I will touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. Afternoon on the Hill by Edna Saint. Mince and Malay. The sky has given over its bitterness. William Williams. Ask not the cause why sullen spring so long delays her flowers to bear, why warbling birds forget to sing and winter storms invert the year. John Dryden. Very nice. The snail goes to sleep and wakes up just as he is by Issa. How stimulating the scenery of the world, the rows of roadside trees, the huge blue sheet of the sky from the parade by Billy Collins. Maybe one more? Do we have one more? We are busy doing nothing, and all we need for that is an afternoon, a rowboat under a sky, and maybe a man fishing from a stone bridge. Or, better still, nobody on that bridge at all. From Poetry by Billy Collins. Mm. Did you notice a theme or a pattern there? What was the pattern? We, well, no, they're not all by Mary Oliver, but we were hoping to bring a little springtime to you today since it's missing outside. That was the topic I asked the students to look up, something that would bring spring in here since it's missing out there. So that's a little gift to you from all of us here at the Arts Council. And uh, students, one last thing that you need to do 
Would you all please turn around and thank your family and friends for being here today? It's important that students have a greater audience than just their English teacher. And so this is a pretty special event. I know you go to many games, um, sporting events, but uh, how often do you get to do something like a poetry reading with your child? So thank you to the family and friends. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to come back up, Jane. Well, what a great event. And you all know, this event could not happen without the teachers here encouraging their students, inspiring them, and teaching them to love poetry. So, we at the Arts Council have gift bags of appreciation to acknowledge these teachers' dedication and support for years with Poetry Live. And in the gift bags that we're going to give them, there are copies of the anthologies for all the students. So every student who is participating today will get an anthology, with your, a published anthology with your poem in it. And then there's a gift card for the teachers to Barnes & Noble that the Arts Council purchased. And then there's a goodie bag, because you know how teachers work late so I'm sure there's one day next week every one of you have to work late. Well, in that bag from Trader Joe's are chocolates and nuts and all kinds of chips. And so you can, one of the days this week when you're there and you need a little sustenance, you can take out that bag. So let's have the uh, middle school teachers come up here to the, to the stage. The middle school teachers who have sponsored students. Come on up. So, um, Ms. Thiel, who um, is Rynek's um, teacher, she had to leave because her son has a, um, a, a game and they had to make it to the game. So, she, I gave her her bag specially. But let's just give a hand for Jenny Thiel from, from Rynek. Okay, come, so come on up, teachers. I just want, so let's hear it for Hammocks with your two teachers up here. Let's hear it. Woo! Okay, so if you notice, the bags have sayings on them, like books are the quiet and most constant of friends. Each bag has a saying. So that's for, um, for, for well, there are three teachers who sponsored students. So one is in here, you'll give it to him. Bob Morrissey and Laura Mercogliano. And yes, and then, um, Lorraine McCurdy Little, so thank you so much. Okay, let's have the um, Mamaronak High School teachers come up. All right. Mamaronak High School, and here comes Aaron Shansky. And I know Juliana Panko and Maria Fairbairn. Thank you so much. And notice their bag. I can't live without books. Or, or the, or the uh, green one. What does the green one say? Oh, reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. So, you know, nice quotes on each of these bags. So thank you so much, Mamaronet. Okay, how about... Let's have Westlake, Mr. Chris DiPolito, come on up. Thank you so much. Okay, Westlake. And you're, you're getting a green bag. And much appreciated. Okay, thank you so much. And then, so... Solange, who's, who's a uh, volunteer on the Arts Committee, you're going to give the last bag to, guess who? Fox Lane, Miss Sarna, Diane Sarna, and then the bouquet. All right. And then, 
We have a, a special little gift since she was our wonderful, e enthusiastic, perfect master of ceremonies. Oh, you okay. All right. Now, we have one more thing to do. It's a little raffle. So when I went to um, Barnes & Noble and I bought these certificates, I said, well, how about giving us, like, um, you know, a gift card for a student to raffle off? They said, oh, okay. So we have a gift card to raffle off. And in here we have the names of every student who participated today. So, one of you is going to get the gift card. But shake it up, okay, and, and when you pick one out, be careful because they could stick together. And the person has to be here. So, if it's okay. a person who's not here, then we'll pick another one. All right, you're gonna read it. I, I'm gonna read it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Emilia Pantagoso. Oh. <laughs> Where are you, come on up. Okay. <laughs> so, Amelia, you have fun spending that. All right. Okay. And now, these flowers. We're hoping that if we call your name, you will want to take home this bouquet for your parents. Yes, Arcadia, the um, florist on Mamaroneck Avenue. Arcadia gave us those. So we're going to call your name, and hopefully your parents are here, and they can take it home, and you can enjoy it. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Jack Cadlick. <laughs> is this? Oh, I know his mom is here. I hope she likes flowers. <laughs> So you can take it at the end, but, okay, is, uh, where's Jack's mom? All oh, right, okay. <laughs> All right, one more. one more for this one. Here we go. Ronnie Aversa. Hey, wow. Okay. Uh, is that okay with you? Yes, are your parents here? Where are they? Okay, okay with you? All right, okay, so that's wonderful. Oh, we're so happy. All right, so you'll take them at the end. Now, in closing, I do want to thank the village of Mamaroneck and the trustees who really fund our programs. So without them, we wouldn't really have an arts council. So, Mayor, I thank you very much. Thank you for your continued support. And I want to thank the members of the Arts Council, so who were here? Shari, Shari Allison, Solange DeSantis, they, everybody helped so much to get this program underway. Jackie, Jacqueline Meyer, Joyce Marie Washburn, and we have Marina Kirakiku here. So I would like to just thank all of the members who helped so much to get this event you know, to be, come to fruition. So let's give them a hand. Um, I want to also thank the Emmeline and Elliot Fox, who's the director, and the production staff and the crew. Everybody was so helpful. I would like to thank LMC TV, who is streaming this live, so your, your uh, relatives who couldn't come can watch this at home. And I thank them for their technical support and the filming. I want to thank the parents for raising such talented, exemplary poets. Thank you. And I want to thank the students, the students who made us richer and more grateful for the power of words today. Thank you, students. Our sponsors, Arcadia Floral, the House of Flowers, if you noticed when you came in, there were all those branches and students um, put on those branches, it's a poet tree. So on the tree, students put 
like poets' names, and they decorated it. So that's there, and that was from the House of Flowers, which is on Mamaroneck Avenue also. Trader Joe's I want to thank for the goodie bags, and Barnes & Noble for the certificate. So now, audience, you can go forth, read your anthologies, take pictures with in front of the poetry or in the lobby, take pictures with your teachers or, or with all of your co-authors and poets, and I wish you a very wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.